Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thanks for fighting your way through the processors outside to be here. Um, I'm Roger. I'll be moderating your panel today. Uh, today we're talking about technology and compliance, um, what everyone's doing about it, what different segments there are, um, and how moving into the future that's going to change. Um, like I said, I'm Roger, Roger Obando. I am co-founder and CTO of a company called Baker Technologies. We, do, we are the industry's leading CRM service provider. We work with uh, almost 1,200 dispensaries around the world, and we've been doing this for a little bit, so people seem to think I know what I'm talking about. Um, mostly, I'm just going to ask these guys questions and sit back and smile. Um, but, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to let each of the panelists introduce themselves, um, and we'll kick it off from there. We'll start with Socrates. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Socrates Rosenfeld. I'm the CEO of uh, Jane Technologies. We've built the cannabis industry's first and we believe fastest growing online marketplace uh, where we allow and enable consumers to shop for their cannabis products from local dispensaries in real time. Uh, we're in 17 states now and uh, really honored to be here. Cool. Um, I'm Pranav, I'm the CEO of Trellis. Uh, we're an inventory tracking software focused on the B2B supply chain. Um, so we work with cultivators, extractors, and distributors. Um, we're across about five states, four countries, um, and growing pretty quickly. Um, my name is Steve Flax. I'm the VP of sales for Biotrack. Um, we're a full service seed to sale technology firm as well, focused on the entire supply chain, um, cultivation, manufacturing, distribution, uh, dispensary, retail. Um, we operate in 32 states, uh, five countries, and hold nine government contracts. Happy to be here. And uh, I'm Blaine from Disru, uh, and we make software for cannabis distributors and manufacturers. Great. Let's give a round of applause for our panel. Happy to have them here. Excited to be here as well. Oh, let me start off with, uh, I'm not being rude. This is where my notes are. It just uh, makes it easier for me to, to remember what we're talking about here. Um, so talking about technology, each one of these companies you know, represents um, an organization that's decided to address the needs of a specific segment of the cannabis market, a specific segment of the supply chain. So um, I would like to ask each one of you, I know you guys give a, a brief uh, introduction about what you do, but let's talk a little bit more about what segment you guys are focusing on um, and, and how, what services you're providing to them. Sock? So we're focused on the uh, business to consumer segment. So if you guys are familiar in the crowd with Grubhub, Right? Uh, can you guys hear me, by the way? The, the, okay, cool. The audio is interesting. Um, so when you're on Grubhub and you're searching for Mexican food, uh, you'll just type it in, and let's say you're in Oakland, you'll be able to see all the restaurants that can provide you Mexican food. Well, we apply that same similar model to cannabis. So whether you're searching for your brand or a favorite strain or an effect, we have proprietary technology that I'll, I'll get into, but we can integrate in any point of sale system in real time so the items that you're looking at, whether you want to compare by price or read reviews, you're afforded that, and then now you can actually shop directly from local dispensaries to you. So that's really where we're focused on. I'm really proud to partner with uh, these really powerful point-of-sale systems here. Cool, yeah, so on the Trellis side, um, I guess going back in the day, we started as a Canadian company. Um, so we built this for the vertically integrated market in Canada. Um, so really focused on supply chain cultivation. And you know, I don't know how much you guys know about the Canadian market, but under the medical market, uh, licensed producers have to ship directly to patients. So there's no dispensaries or anything along those lines. And the regulatory requirements along that process is pretty robust. So that's when we got in in 2014. And, and then we moved to California in 2016. Uh, our first client was a nursery, so we really focused on dialing in um, that side of the business. And then our next client was a cultivator that would take the clones, harvest, and uh, create their finished products. Then we had uh, Jetty Extracts as a client, which uh, was on the manufacturing side, so they took the trim uh, and the flour and you know made oils. And then our next client was Distribution, uh, that took the finished product, packaged it up, and sell it to retail. So our our platform and our business kind of grew as our customer segments grew and kind of you know came organically. Um, but those are really where we focus is that back end manufacturing supply chain side. So similar to to Pranav, we. We focus on uh, the seed to sale tracking. Um, we started off originally as a pharmaceutical-based software tracking opioids in Florida in 2010. Um, 
back in 2014, there was a uh, state of Washington put out an RFP for seed to sale tracking for their recreational market. We happened to throw our hat in the ring and, and ended up getting that, and that kind of got us on the map in terms of um, the government side. Kind of morphed into our commercial business where um, you know, we focus on the entire supply chain. Um, it's more of a business tool that happens to integrate with the, the state regulatory bodies and their systems. Um, obviously, compliance is a huge thing. So being able to capture business information for whatever um, license type you hold and ensure compliance um, is our focus. Uh, so Distro uh, spawned out of the need for distribution. Uh, as the industry is like growing, uh, distributors are becoming more important, and uh, how you manage your sales to all the different dispensaries is becoming more vital. Uh, so we help the brands and distributors uh, market to their dispensaries, manage large sales teams, manage multi-warehousing, uh, manage how they expose their inventory to their dispensaries and their sales reps, uh, kind of just the logistics from source to sale. Uh, so everything in between cultivation and retail. Great. Thank you, guys. Uh, let me see by, by a show of hands, how many folks in the room are already in the cannabis industry operating um, present day? All right. Good number. And I'm assuming a lot of others are thinking about it and trying to get into the space. Hands? No? All right. We got a lot of, we got a lot of just uh, cannabis fans then. That's cool. Um, so, you know, I think it, it, we, all, we all know each other's companies um, quite a bit, and there's a little bit of overlap uh, in, in amongst all the things that we do. But I think it's, it's safe to say that, you know, what we're all trying to do is provide the tools that will allow our clients to operate in a, you know, compliance way, right? That's, that's, that's the value that we hope to bring to the table to make sure people are being compliant, to make sure that that compliance doesn't take over their entire day. You know, I think, you know, a lot of what we are all trying to do is allow them to be compliant without having to think about being compliant. Um, so I think we all work with a different part of the segment of the market. Um, can each one of you guys talk a little bit about what sort of specific part of the regulations you're helping your customers deal with. You know, for us, for example, you know, we do a lot of CRM work. Uh, we do a lot of marketing work. So for us, honestly, we're ancillary business, and we're dealing more with federal communication regulations, TCPA compliance, making sure that no one's getting a text message without having opted in for it, et cetera, right? And so we're, we're dealing it with that at a very high level, but that's nowhere near the level of, of compliance these guys are helping to deal with. So talk a little bit about some, you know, examples of what your customers are using your platform to stay compliant with day to day. Sure. So I'm in a similar boat as Roger. Um, we're we're just a, a tech company. Uh, so really, where we work into the compliance scenario is we're less the uh, the police officers of what's in compliant and what's not, and more so supporters of dispensaries to build a very modular, adaptable solution. For instance, um, in Massachusetts, where delivery is just starting to get going, we have the capabilities to turn delivery on very easily. In Vegas, where delivery is already legal, but you're not allowed to deliver to certain zip codes, we can make a very modular system for our dispensary partners. Um, Rec and Med, same deal. Really where we are looking at and where compliance affects us the most is in online payments. Um, so similar back to the Grubhub example, why everybody loves Grubhub is you can just upload your credit card and, and pay multiple times, um, all using a single sign-on. You can't do that yet. So for us, when you make a, an, an online order or a reservation, it doesn't consummate the sale necessarily. Um, so that's really been our bottleneck in the compliance game. Uh, but really, our position and where we stand at, at Jane Technologies is to really support dispensaries because compliance is everything for them. And the moment they're out of compliance or don't have a software solution that is adaptable and flexible enough to, to maintain compliance, it's very important. So, you know, we consider ourselves real partners for our dispensaries. Cool. Um, so on the trellis side, I mean, seat to sale tracking is a requirement for any licensee. Uh, at a very high level, you need to track every piece of cannabis product that goes into your facility, uh, usually using barcodes. And you know, it's every plant gets a barcode, every batch gets a barcode, you track it forward until it's packaged and sold. If there's ever a recall scenario, you need to be able to track it back, uh, collect all the material and, and go through that process. So, you know, that's, that's where we started and that's what we focused on. But uh, at Trellis, at least, we, we kind of 
t take that as table stakes. Like anyone in this industry, uh, especially like from a service provider standpoint, need to help with compliance. But it's really the value add that you add on top of that that's going to differentiate you in the market. Um, when you look at systems like Metric, for example, uh, here in California, it's a pretty basic system. It's just barcodes, quantities, yields, where is it at, that type of information. Um, but what we noticed was as we started working with our clients, it's really about the operations side. And when we came out to California back in 2016, very few people cared about compliance, especially because it wasn't set at that time. Um, and so most people were scaling their business and what, that's what they cared about is, man, I can't even manage the demand that I have. I can't manage the supply partners that I have. Uh, and those are the types of things that folks are looking for from their technology solutions. So that's where we focused on was a workflow system that really manages the whole manufacturing process and cultivation process while keeping compliance as, again, a table stakes uh, requirement. So kind of to dovetail on that, I mean, I feel like, you know, we're in the similar space. Um, one thing that I like to highlight is that Biotrack is used as a system of control. So you can limit who gets access into doing what, preventing issues from occurring, preventing people from not being able to, uh, you know, enter in wrong information or something like that. Um, you know, we also offer a point of sale, and I feel like the limit tracking is extremely important in the, in the California market, and that's something that could change. You know, they've, they recently just dropped the, the medical down to, to one ounce, I believe, and being able to prevent your, your staff from over dispensing is very important. Um, we've seen it in Colorado where we are, where companies get shut down and licenses get lost because they over dispense. And without a system to prevent that, you're running a risk of, of losing a lot of investment. So um, it's kind of where we like to focus as well. And yeah, not to like rehash, I mean, we all do kind of the same thing. We integrate with the track and trace programs. They manage inventory, and then we add features on top of it. Um, so for us, our focus is on things like making sure that you are able to provide your dispensaries, a view of your inventory, your current inventory count, and your sales rep know what inventory you have so they don't sell against each other, and then eventually taking that order and then fulfilling that and turning that into what will integrate with then track and trace. Um, but yeah, as I said, it's just... Whatever features you add on top of track and trace that make us all special, um, figure out what your company does, and you should look into what your needs are, and then kind of poke around with the different software providers, and you'll find what you really need. Sure. Oh, that got louder. All right. Um, that's good. Uh, so as mentioned before, really what we're looking for is a above board, regulated, compliant payment solution. You'll see a lot of solutions out there using cryptocurrency, which is interesting. Personally, I, I don't yet understand it, so I imagine a lot of consumers don't as well. There are other solutions out there that are moving into the space, um, and we're always looking for different solutions to provide the ability for our consumers to pay for uh, their cannabis before coming in to pick it up at the store, get it delivered. Um, where we hope to take this is eventually to have that ability. There's no reason why, in my opinion, you can upload a credit card on Uber and have a stranger pick you up and drive to the airport in the morning. It should be no different as to getting your medicine. And so that's really what we're looking for. I think the industry is looking for that and, and something that we're very excited to see come to fruition here in the next few years. Great. Uh, I I really like the fact that you touched on, on crypto. I've been having that conversation quite a bit lately, much to the dismay of a lot of folks in the industry. Ken, if you're in here, I'm sorry. But like honestly, um, I, I am really curious to see how many people in here feel that they know how crypto works fairly well. Yeah, that's what I thought. Um, how many people in here have ever used a crypto wallet to pay for anything? All right, that's about right. All right, so that's, that's the, the issue at... at at, uh, at hand here that I think Socrates was referring to as well is just that there's a lack of understanding and when you're, when you're trying to convince people to use a brand new technology that they don't know how, they don't understand how it works, it's very difficult to convince a large enough portion of the market to do that, right? I'm not saying that solutions aren't coming. Um, you know, the, the running gag that I like to use when I do these things is if I had a nickel for every time someone tried to sell me a crypto solution for one of my problems, I'd be retired by now. Um, but and there's a lot of that going on. Not to say that, in my mind, 
um, and not to hijack the panel too long, um, that there's no applications for blockchain technology, which is the underlying technology behind um, cryptocurrency, because I think there's, I mean, in Pranav, you can probably talk about this. I mean, I think there's, there's a huge application possibility for track and trace. Um, I'm going off script here completely, but do you want to touch on that at all as far as uh, blockchain? Yeah, for sure. We get uh, approached all the time about integrating blockchain, crypto into our, our software. And my philosophy on it is it's a general ledger, uh, which is very important, but it's more applicable to a government system. Um, that's a centralized ledger that everyone feeds into, and it's a central source of, of, of uh, truth. If you try to implement it more at an operator level, you're basically building a silo, uh, which takes away the, the big benefit of blockchain. So yeah, that's kind of my opinion on it. Yeah, no, I completely agree. All right, enough on the crypto bashing. Um, so uh, Steve, you know, Biotrack has been in the game longer than anyone else up here. And so I feel like um, you've probably seen, as a company, more changes in regulation um, that you've had to deal with than, than any of us. I mean, we've all had to deal with it in the different markets that we're in, um, but you've, you've, your company's seen it more than anybody. Um, have there been any sort of huge regulatory changes that have impacted your operations more than, than in others? Like, is there something in specific that's changed, whether recently or, or, or further in the past, that really caused a lot of problems from a product development point of view? You know, I think that from the very beginning, our goal was to have a solution that can be in every single regulated market. And with that said, every single market has different regulations. Uh, I think that roughly I don't know, I'd say 70% of each market has a similar, similar regulations, give or take a tweak here, a tweak there. Um, you know, from a integration standpoint, you know, some of the tricky things have been integrating into the DMV system for New York to track, track the patients and stuff like that. I mean, that's integrating into an Oracle system or uh, integrating into just the compliant track and trace systems, you know, the metrics um, out there. Um, those aren't easy to, easy to do. And... I think that presents um, a challenge for everybody who's integrating in, and then once you're integrating in, how you sell the value of your product on top of that, just like these guys said. So um, I think the, the flexibility of our system allows us to, to make those uh, twists and turns as every market we enter, but at the same time, know what we want to focus on and, and, and do that. Great, thank you very much. Um, Pranav and Blaine, I, I think you guys, uh, more so than the rest of us up here, are dealing with what I'll refer to as the middle segment of the supply chain, right? You're, you're not dealing with the consumer. Um, you're not necessarily dealing with a cultivator all the time. Um, so I, I'm assuming that that brings along with it its own uh, challenges, but also opportunities for integration with other systems, right? Um, why don't we start with, with you, Blaine? Like, w what sort of systems currently are you, are you working on integrating with, and, and what do you see in the future as far as a uh, holy grail of integration? Uh, I mean, it'll just come over time. I think it's naturally just like retail's kind of doing their own thing and cultivation's doing their own thing and then distribution, the brands are doing their own thing. Um, metrics kind of like a natural integration. Like if you want to integrate like inventory across like a vertically integrated business, like we all integrate with metric and then that just kind of like naturally disseminates through them. So that's like an awesome piece of glue across it. But in terms of like the value adds, kind of like how POS has been integrating with Baker and you guys have been a staple integration on that side. I'd say like LeafLink is like, if they keep their traction of growing us all across all the places, we'd love to integrate with them. Uh, weed maps and kind of connecting the dots there. I think the big one for me is that if you look at every other industry, brands all market directly to the consumers. Coca-Cola doesn't market to Target. Like, they don't have to market to Target, like, but all brands are marketing to the equivalent of Target right now. Um, and no brand is marketing to consumers. So like, that's one of our long-term goals is to enable brands to view their marketing and their sales to the dispensaries just as much as they do their, their marketing and sales to the consumer. And if we can bridge that gap in one picture with Distro, that would be awesome. Okay, and that's, that's a really interesting topic because Steve and I were talking about that earlier. Pranav, did you want to chime in on that as well? Uh, yeah, I mean, just generally speaking, the cannabis industry does lack, I hate to use buzzwords, but like an ERP system yeah. that is full-fledged, end-to-end manufacturing type of uh, platform. And you think traditional industries like SAP, Oracle, et cetera. Um, I think with the pace that this industry is evolving at, 
it's going to require integrations for a solution like that to come like in place for the industry. Um, on our side, you know, we have uh, connections into POS providers to cover off retail. Um, we're metric, obviously. Uh, we have QuickBooks and accounting, um, HR type of system. So what we, when we started, we really saw like inventory tracking as kind of the backbone of the industry, and then everything else is very, you know, focused on that kind of silo and plugging it in and making that data cross seamlessly is exactly what this industry is, you know, requiring. So I think that's where it's going to go. Great. I want to touch on something that, that Blaine just said. I'm, again, I'm going to go off script. I have a tendency to do that. Um, we were sitting um, outside getting ready to, to speak on this panel, and, and um, we were talking about how California right now is unique in the distribution model. Um, you know, my company is based out of Denver. You know, a lot of my experience was, was Denver, Oregon, Washington. And in those uh, states, there was a large vertical integration push, right? So if you walked into a light shade dispensary, if you walked into an altitude dispensary, you were buying light shade product or altitude product, right? So there was, there was no need for the brands to really do anything other than be visible as a, as a dispenser, as a dispensary. Um, this market's very different, and I'm, I hope I'm not telling you guys something you already know, but you know, from here, there's so many different segments of the market. There's a cultivator. The cultivator then sells their product to the producer. The producer then distributes their product to a distributor. The distributor then goes out and has a relationship with the retailer, and the retailer eventually gets that product to the consumer. Right, so to speak to Blaine's point, like at that point, the brand has no idea who the consumer is, right? Because it's gone through so many hands, it's really, really difficult to to get that data. And that data, that's really, really valuable. I mean, California, right now, truly is a, a hotspot for innovation on brands. I mean, I think the fact that we've had uh, some sort of legal system for the last 20 years really has helped to establish the fact that that's going to be something that is important. So, I think what's the last piece that's missing is how do we loop that feedback from the consumer back to the cultivator, the producer, and like really close that loop so that the product, the, the product improvement can, can come along down the line. You know, if I'm selling you a product and selling it as a sleep aid, I need to know, is this actually helping you as a sleep aid? Um, curious, anyone, jump in. Like, how, how do you think, what are the opportunities there? Yeah, I, I, I'd love to take a crack at this. I spend hell of time with this microphone. Um, so similar to how, if you think about marketplaces, uh, similar to how why you go back to a Netflix or why you go back to Amazon, we, we boiled it down, or our, our hypothesis is it's boiled down to a couple of reasons. Number one is that you know with certainty that most documentaries out there, if you're looking for a documentary, it's going to be on Netflix. Or if you're looking for a sports apparel or something like that, it's probably going to be on Amazon. So that's kind of the one big thing. The second big thing that we, we believe marketplaces do very well is the ability to curate products hyper-personal to that consumer. And the way they do it is not only do they understand how the individual consumer shops, but they're able to connect the dots on similar consumers and how they shop. So when you're on Amazon, for instance, and they say, hey, you bought product X, we recommend product Y, or people who have searched for this documentary also end up watching this documentary. That's that feedback loop that we're very interested in and, and something that we're very actually well positioned to collect and capture. And the way we get back to the industry is to go back to these brands in addition to the retailers and say, hey, there are a lot of data companies out there that have the ability to tell you how many candy bars or gummies were purchased in San Francisco in a given month. What we're able to do because we follow and track the consumer shopping behavior from not just one purchase, but their entire purchasing history. Now we can say this is actually not only what people are, are buying, but how they're shopping for them. And we think that's the next evolution in the ability now for brands to, to market directly to the consumer, similar to any other retail product you see out there. Yeah, and I think also that to go along with that, um, some sophisticated uh, practices like shopping cart analysis, right? It's another thing that, that will be Really interesting to see how soon we can get an effective system in place for that. And you know, for, for those people who might not be familiar with this, shopping cart analysis is, you know, I go and I buy um, a Kiva product, right? And so that's that's easy to track. I see that on the you know um, on the sales list, but I need to know what else is in that person's shopping cart, 
Like I want to know that the consumer of this one product is also buying this product and this product. Um, it's great for R&D as far as like, you know, if you have a correlation between people who are buying mints and people who are buying beverages, then the mint producers should probably look into developing beverages, right? Because they want to capture that audience and they know that it's a loyalist to the brand. Um, and so I think that would be, you know, a really interesting addition um, as well. Pranav, you have something you want to add? Yeah, I, I'm going to kind of play the other side of the coin, which is at the same time, we're also seeing this product and this market become commoditized. We're seeing that happen in Canada. And even if you look at like traditional black market, you know, a mid is a mid, you know, hydro is hydro. And, and that's kind of how consumers have started to, you know, go towards it. So I think that's ideal and it would be great to see, but I, it hasn't happened in the past. Yeah, I would agree. So, uh, yeah, on the marketing consumers from the brand's perspective, I think that there's, like, two problems there. Like, one is, like, understanding, like, how they do things on the macro trends. Like, what are they buying? How are they buying? Shopping cart analysis and all that. And I think companies like iHeartJane and Baker and uh, BDS and Headset can provide them that data. And I think that they're solving that really well. And the problem that I'm interested in that is honestly a data problem, and I think there's only two major solutions, is how the brands can understand, the, take control of that consumer. And one of the solutions is basically you have solutions like our iHeart Jane normalizing that data. So it's the problem is that all these dispensaries have their inventory systems, and it's really hard to connect that to the actual brand's inventory. So knowing when you're ordering this product from this brand's website that it's actually matching up with this dispensaries data. So you either need to have something like iHeart Jane or Baker normalize the data, or you're going to have single providers like Ease or Blackbird Logistics that will just say, hey, we're the only provider. I don't need to normalize anything. This product is this product. Like you're ordering it from us. Like we don't have to question if this brand's product matched up with this dispensary. We are the dispensary. So uh, I think that it's a race to see if it's Weed Maps, Baker, iHeart Jane normalizing the data on a technical level or if the big distributors get there. But that's how the brands are going to take control of actually, you know, as I said, taking control of the consumer. Right, and that's, and that's a great point, and it's something, I'll get the questions in just one second. Um, that's an issue that we've dealt with since, you know, day one. Data normalization is a huge problem in this industry. It's, you know, there's no universal product code. There's no UPC that I can scan that tells me that this is the exact same product that I bought six months ago. And, you know, we, again, going back to the integrations, uh, you know, much like iHeartJane, um, Baker integrates with all the point of sale systems, we integrate with Leafly, we integrate with Weed Maps, and at the end of the day, you know, when you find the source of that data, it was somebody typing it in to a form, right? And so there's typos, there's, you know, Blue Dream with a dash, Blue Dream with a space, Blue Dream is one word, right? And from a, you know, from a non-nerd perspective, you're like, well, yeah, it's all Blue Dream, but for those of us who are technical in the room, it's like, no, those are three very different things, and it's very difficult to figure out that that is the same product. And then you throw brands, producers, all that into the, in, into the um, mix, and, and it, it gets really, really difficult. Um, one of the topics that uh, I've been talking with my team about quite a bit is you know, to come together as uh, the technology companies in the space and create some sort of consortium that will produce a universal product code for the cannabis space that will track everything. And I know there's been efforts being done uh, by several different entities in the space. Curious to hear you guys, your thoughts on, is it happening? Who's doing it? When will it actually work? Or are people just kind of keeping that all to themselves at this point? Yeah, so um, you, you make a great point about normalizing that data. And so we have the capabilities to integrate, uh, and a lot of people define integration differently. Um, the way we define our integration is not only can we actually speak to point of sale systems, but also when we pull a disparate point of, uh, disparate point of data, like a Blue Dream with a hyphen or lowercase or undercase, whatever that is, we pull that through our standardized taxonomy um, catalog. We have about 75,000 products on our marketplace, all standardized. And so what that means is whether or not you're using a BioTrack or a Trees or a Flow Hub, or whether or not the actual bud tender is inputting that specific menu item correctly or incorrectly, it's on, I think, integrators like us to be able to pull that data point and make it very clean, not only for the dispensaries and the retailers, but also for the consumer. If you pull up a website, um, like Weed Maps, for instance, and you type in Blue Dream, you're going to see Blue Dream listed about 14 different ways. So what does that do to shopper confidence? 
right? It doesn't help the industry at all. It doesn't help the retailer. It doesn't help the consumer. But when you see, you type in Blue Dream and you see Blue Dream that's standard across the board, across multiple different point of sale systems, geographies, retailers, that's really what we're looking for and something that we are really focused on because we need this standardized taxonomy of nomenclature of product because ultimately that benefits the consumers. No, absolutely. Anybody else want to chime in on this? Yeah, I, I think your question was more around consolidation in the market. It was. I mean, I think really it is around this problem specifically. And again, I, I totally went off script with this, so putting you on the spot. But um, as far as that universal product code, uh, you know, the companies in the space working together to come up with something that we can all agree upon as this is the system. Like, have, are we seeing any of those efforts happening now? And if not, is that something that you would be interested in? Yeah, I think generally speaking, there's been a couple folks in the market that have tried to go like open source and this is what the standard is going to be across the industry. But with so much pl like players in the industry focused on their kind of individual silos, like integration is great, but it's so difficult to get everyone on the same page. If I think if it happens, it would happen from a regulatory perspective. Um, and the more evolution that there is on regulations and what is a strain, what is a phenotype, what, it, what are the average you know, expected results of di you know, different strains, that type of stuff, if it can happen at the regulatory level, that's going to be the you know, biggest driving force towards standardization in the industry. I, I, I completely agree. It's just going to be up to the regulatory bodies, uh, but they're kind of like shielded through the government. I, with, with all the states doing their individual track trace systems, I have zero faith in that happening, and I have zero faith in all of us getting along and doing that. Um, I, the, like, uh, the only thing I believe in is for someone like Baker to create a, like a machine learning or some sort of like, like you read through all these blue dreams and based on these trends, you can start to do it better than anyone. And then you maybe like piggyback off our data to make that more accurate. Yeah. But I think it's going to be you. <laughs> like, I, think, I think you're going to do it. <laughs> like, you know, someone like you or Wheat Maps or something like that. And someone's going to do that. Yeah, I think, you know, uh, Bakers of the world, the, you know, the... Um, I heart Janes of the world, we're, we're in a unique position because we are ingesting data from everywhere, right? What I'm hoping for, what I'm looking forward to um, is uh, the equivalent of the Google Maps API, right? So uh, right now, and, and for developers out there, you probably know what I'm talking about. You can enter the most mangled address into Google Maps and it will say, are you, is this the address you were looking for? Nine times out of 10, it's gonna be the right thing. And it's standardized. So basically you can standardize the data you get back. And I think the minute someone can come up with a system like that where you can just throw a product at it and it says 98% certainty, it's this is what you're talking about. At that point, that'll make all of our lives so much easier because the data is what everyone is really looking at right now. And it's slight, you know, Slight uh, differentiations in data make a huge difference. You know, I know the guys at Headset very well. If you guys aren't familiar with them, they do uh, data analysis in the space. And you know, they started off doing data normalization in Washington, which is a relatively small marketplace. And I know that from the beginning, they were just really overwhelmed by how much work it was to get some real solid numbers on that. Um, those guys are doing a great job as well, though. Uh, Steve, let's continue on the, the topic of, of data and single source of truth. Right, as a point of sale provider, I think uh, over the years we've realized that a lot of the dispensary customers focus on the POS for being their single source of truth. For that's where I drive all the data, and afterwards I just want to distribute it out from there to all these other ancillary systems. Uh, what sort of things are you guys doing over at Biotrack to ensure that they can leverage the system in that way? Well, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot of things that the system can do a, in, how do I say this? There's a lot of data, obviously, inside Biotrack, and I don't think that um, at the end of the day, we want Biotrack to be that one single source for information. Um, there's going to be some companies that want to have that. There's going to be others that utilize it for what it's for and utilize other integration partners to see the value of that data. Um, I think that, kind of back to the question of a few minutes ago, it's going to be very difficult for somebody to come out of the, the gates with an end-to-end -end solution that's going to have every single thing, every checkbox checked for each person. Um, I think trying to overdo it is going to be a big issue. So focusing on what we do and you know, giving the data and allowing it to be sucked out, pushed in, whatever it is, I think is, is our focus. I also feel that you know, um, 
it's really up to the, yeah. So that's what I was going to say. I, I have one question for you yeah. because you guys are the one of the only people that actually does like the track and trace. You are a track and trace provider. Yeah. I mean, have you thought about like unifying you like codes across all your different states? <laughs> what you moderating that? <laughs> I'm just asking. <laughs> I mean, I don't know if that's a that's a question for me. Um, but at the end of the day, um, you know, it's probably something that's thought of. Um, but you know, part of the, the value proposition that, that we have is that you know, customers have their data, and that's not really something we, we dig into too often, um, if at all, just because the nature of, of, of how it operates. So uh, customers control their own data, and they can manip manipulate that data however they want. Um, at the end of the day, you know, integrations are going to be what, what needs to happen for uh, customers to remain uh, using your systems and explaining the data to them in a fashion that's going to help them make better business decisions as a group and all that. And I feel like there's a lot of business tools out there. And like you said earlier, if, as long as everybody can play together, the industry is going to move forward. And unless that happens, everybody's going to be kind of doing their own thing and, you know, fighting in the back alleys uh, at some point, which we don't want to have happen. Great. Thanks, Steve. Um, let's keep it on point of sale, and uh, let's keep the names of the companies out of it. I see trees in the audience. I see we have some Biotrack folks. I see, there's a lot, a lot of POS representation here. Um, so, but I'm curious to, to hear from you, Socrates, especially, since you, like us, deal a lot with integra these integrations. And um, Can you talk about some trends, some advancements that we're seeing um, that are going to help with regulation, or are going to help even with just this integration of this ecosystem? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I think it does start with the point of sale system as the source of truth. It's what it is the backbone upon which all retail operations are built, whether that's inventory, compliance, um, finalizing the transactions, et cetera. So w what we do, and, and we consider all point of sale systems real partners of ours. They serve a, a specific purpose. Um, and our, <clears throat> our challenge to ourselves is to minimize the amount of work that's required from anybody else, uh, especially retailers. The retailers are doing enough. The last thing they need to do is manually update menu items to allow their online store to be accurate. So we've removed that variable. Next for us is what we want to do is, is take the integrations even further. So in-store displays, there are um, you know, fleet management solutions. There are in-store ordering solutions out there. Um, you know, consistent theme on the panel is let's work together on this. And, and for us, we see ourselves as really integration experts. And if we can take the information at the source of truth, being the point of sale system, and make that data available to other stakeholders in the industry to do with it whatever they want, hopefully it's to provide more value for the industry, then, then we really want to make that data available for everyone. So um, to be honest with you, we, we really just want to continue to push the envelope. I know we're not mentioning any names, but there are point of sale systems whereby we're not only just pulling menu items in real time, but when actual online orders are being placed through the iHeartGene platform, we have the ability to push those online orders directly back into the point of sale system itself. So there's no separate fulfillment software for the retailers. It's just kind of shaving down the inefficiencies uh, across the entire fulfillment process that we're really obsessed about. And uh, it's been a pleasure working with a lot of point of sale systems that are trying to push the industry in that direction as well. Yeah, I'd like to, to echo that sentiment. I mean, it's been a pleasure seeing the POS space really continue to grow and, and, and having uh, more and more options and, and that driving each company to, to keep driving forward. Um, it's been really interesting to watch. Uh, I'm assuming we got some questions. I want to leave some time to let these guys answer. But I just I want to ask one last question. I'll run it down the line. And, uh, and then we can open it up to, to Q&A. Um, generic, but I want to hear about where you think tech is going. What trends are we seeing? What do you think is going to take hold? And what's going to be a, a, a big advancement in the coming, let's call it a year to two? Um, I'm just going to probably repeat myself, but I think there will come a time very soon where you log on to a, micro, a marketplace, and hopefully it's on iheartjane.com, where they recognize exactly who you are, where you are, and can recommend products based on your shopping behavior and other like consumers just like you. So for instance, if you shop in San Francisco a lot on iHeartChain, you take a flight, you go to Boston, you open up the app, they'll say, hey, welcome back, Roger. 
We recognize how you shot back in San Francisco. Here are very similar products to you here in Boston, and we think that's the next evolution and something that we're really excited to bring to the market soon. I think that tech's going to evolve the same way the industry evolves. Um, you know, cannabis is in a maturity curve. Right now it's pretty early days, and everyone's really focused on compliance, making sure they get licensed, make sure they can keep their license. Um, so that's probably going to be the next, call it, three to five years, and then once things kind of stabilize, then it's about differentiating and all the value adds and becoming more efficient as a business, uh, and I think that's where the technology will go. Yeah, and I think that, you know, some of the consumer behavior is going to depend on where the technology goes to. You know, you look at some of the niches that some of these companies are finding where it's geared to a specific demographic. Uh, delivery, for example, some people don't want to go into a dispensary. So I think that could thrive um, at some point. I also think that, um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity for just mobile apps. Um, I feel like the fast check-in is going to be something that you're going to see more often. Um, kiosks, you know, I don't know if that's going to go three, five years down the road, but I think it'll be something that, you know, you'll see in, in dispensaries um, moving forward. Uh, and at uh, Distri, we fundamentally believe that, similar to alcohol in the food industry, that brands and distributors are going to become a major kind of like portion of the industry. So we think that logistics uh, software that kind of connects the dots between uh, the supply chain is going to be really important. All right, awesome. Thank you, guys. All right, let's, uh, let's open up the q and I think I'm going to get my game show host on. I'm going to come down and walk around. Um, you've been waiting to ask a question, so there you go. Hi, my name is Becca Dubois. My company is Can Account Pro, and things that are flying through my brain right now is how do we take the seed to sale, the POS, we bring the information to our accounting system without spending an ungodly amount of money on accounting? Um, it seems, you know, in, in my mind, what I'm thinking is if there were some standardization throughout the industry for agreement on what is this product, and that would be very easy in the testing phase, in the IP phase, so maybe somebody comes up with a new strain, that strain is goes through IP, and those parameters describe the name of that product. So then in seed to sale, it goes on there. Then that can drop down into the POS. The POS information can then drop down into QuickBooks. That's the way I'd like to see it, but there is no real um, flow that I'm hearing or seeing in the industry at this point. Can you help me with that? Who wants to take that one? Anybody? Anybody? I mean, you should check out our demo. We do it pretty well. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say that same thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, absolutely. I'll, I'll, you know, I think that, and, and maybe I am, am confu I'm misunderstanding the question, but I feel like there's a, a, a lot of local counties, at least in California, that are trying to institute some standardized system um, at, the, at the county level to, to manage all that information and keep it semi-closed loop, I think that that's kind of where it's at. And I know that in a lot of these other states, I mean, it's fed into a centralized database. That database manages all the testing. They allow you to sell product once it's passed testing, and it kind of, kind of has that natural flow. Um, obviously, for recalls and stuff like that, that's important too. So I think that, I don't know if that's starting to happen, but I definitely know that in, in some areas, I mean, there's a county system, and everybody who's in that county is required to report into that, and then that would then feed into a, another state, state system for compliance. Yeah, and just to add to that, like here in California, we haven't seen Metric go live yet, um, but once it does, that system actually does standardize quite a few things across the industry. Um, like things like uh, when you make adjustments to your inventory, there's a set list of adjustments that Metric creates, so everyone's kind of calling it the same thing. Uh, same with all your inventory categories. They get categorized by categories that Metric has created, which, again, goes across the industry. So, um, you know, I would check out some of the other states where Metric is live, but I think once that system is in place, it'll help standardize in the industry. Yeah, and I just, you know, I'll, I'll echo what these guys are saying. I think the goal for all of our companies, and I, I started off with this, is to make life easier for all of our customers, right? And I, I see the pain point. I think the one thing that you mentioned, which is interesting to me, but then again, I don't deal with this really on a regular basis, but it is that last step of getting the data into the accounting software. Um, is there anybody up here who's doing that currently? You guys are doing it already. You guys are doing it. So it's, it's, it's something that's already being done. It's just a matter of which segment of the, of the market you're in, I see. Cool. Who else has a question? Can't be just one, really. 
Back here. It's kind of fun to run around the room. All right, I'm making this up on the fly. Um, my name is Bill DeZenzo, and I'm with TaxNexus, and I have an automated cannabis tax compliance solution, and I was just interested to hear um, from folks um, about what their thoughts are about um, tax compliance moving forward, especially for the state of California with how difficult things are and, and whether they think that um, the industry is actually going to be able to come up to speed to, to be tax compliant without a solution like mine. Yeah, I mean, I can take that because like, we primarily focus on distributors and so for California, they do all of the tax management for their brands they work with and the dispensaries. Um, it's not that complicated. I mean, just when you do an invoice, you just need to make sure you indicate how much money you're supposed to remit. And when you do a sale purchase order, you're supposed to indicate how much you're supposed to remit. And you hold on to the cash and you pay it monthly. Um, it's not too crazy. It's really just like, do you have the you know infrastructure to make sure you're actually managing your cash correctly is usually the biggest bottleneck. Make sure you get your COD and like you're getting paid the cash when you deliver it and all that. I mean, back to, back to one of the questions Roger asked earlier was, you know, what changes are you making to the system to accommodate X, Y, and Z? I mean, the fair market value taxation in, in California is important, and the 15% excise tax at the point of sale is important, and making sure that your system, back to the data, can set that up properly so at the end of the month or whatever, whatever it is, you can generate a tax breakdown report and have that automatically be sent to the CPA so they can do what they need to do with it. Um, so I feel like that's been, it's been a challenge because there's specific numbers that you have to insert and it's based on pounds and stuff like that on one end and then it's the 15% on the other. So, you know, that's been definitely a challenge but I think it's, it comes back to what data you have in the system and how you manage that. And like, I think the biggest problem with taxes is definitely the fact that it's just all cash. Like, one of our clients like literally paid their excise tax and they, state that their bank account shut down because it's too big of a cash payment. So, like, that's the problem right now in the, of the industry, not the accounting part. Yeah, and ironically, uh, you got to pay taxes in cash and you get fined for paying your taxes in cash, <laughs> and they won't let you pay your taxes in any other way that isn't cash. So that's uh, quite a racket they've got going right now. Uh, any more questions? Here you go. Jocelyn. What's up, guys? I'm Jocelyn with Headset. Um, comment and then a question. So on the universal product code, obviously like fully understand, have had conversations with folks in this room about that. Um, I thought it'd be helpful to put into context kind of what we're seeing from our side because we're collecting 300,000 different product names and we have to employ an entire team to do this. So like it's like running a separate little side business. Um, so I think creating some kind of type of alliance in which we're all working off this, like headset, could we could probably contribute to that. Um, I lead our California strategy and operations, and so my question, aside from that comment, is more, um, are you guys seeing the same thing that I'm seeing? Like, I think there's a, and this is buzzword, lack of education in the space, especially when it comes to retailers or dispensaries, understanding the power of their own data, and really how to action on that simplistically and not making it uh, overly complicated. Are you guys finding the same things in trying to educate retailers? Like, is it a challenge for you trying to educate them? Like, this is what data is, this is how you use it. This is why it's imperative to being successful a year from now, future. Thank you very much. Uh, I'll, I'll touch on that a little bit. We've actually, we're having this, Steve and I were having this conversation earlier um, about how in new markets, you kind of see the same trends over and over again, right? If you come into the market, you see uh, uh, a lot of people who are transitioning from the illicit market into the legal market, trying, you know, I joke about how in the early days I couldn't sell my systems a CRM because no one in the industry knew what the hell a CRM was. Um, so we had to like really change the way you communicate and educate, you know, the, the, the dispensary client in that way. But what we've seen at Baker happen 
uh, in all the markets. Almost every market that we've moved into that's been legal for over, let's call it 18 to 24 months, is you see an influx of professionals from other industries, senior level executives as well, um, that were may have been hesitant before legalization comes around. Uh, but once they do come in, you know, I went from trying to explain to people what a CRM was to people critiquing my CRM and telling me all the things that it should do that it doesn't do yet, right? So, and that's, you know, it might seem argumentative, but that's the conversation we'd rather be having. Like, that's, that's what I want to know. And so, you know, I guess the question really is, have you guys seen similar uh, things and if you have anything to, to add to that? Yeah, so just for clarity, like, we work with some of the largest operators in California. Our clients are Harborside, Jungle Boys, Loud Pack, Corova, pretty much all the big brands in California. And I would say it's a very small subset of our client base that's really into the data and looking for the trends and focused on that. I think you guys and Headset and Trellis have a shared client with Kaliva, and they're like a great example of someone that takes it kind of on the, the other end of the spectrum and really like gets into the trend analysis and the metric and metrics and those types of things. But from what we've seen, it's a pretty small subset of the industry. Yeah, I, I would agree. And I think, um, it's, I don't think it's just for the cannabis industry. Largely, if you think about what the cannabis industry is at a, at a retail level, you're not dealing with Targets and Walmarts. You're dealing with really small, single license Yet. entities, largely you know, small business owners. And they're just trying to get off the ground and sell their product and do scheduling and do all the crazy stuff that retailers do. I think it's onus is on companies like Headset and Jane to say, hey, let's keep things simple. Instead of calling it data, here are the products that you should be carrying, or here are the products that bring people back, or hey, here's how your products are being priced in San Francisco, for instance, and kind of in encourage that dialogue first. I, I agree with Roger. I think there are more and more sophisticated operators moving in, but I, I heard some statistic where, you know, there's, I don't know, four to 6,000 retailers out there, not a single entity controls over 1% of the market share. So to, to think that they're gonna now dive into market basket analysis and understanding Complements versus substitutes is a little bit complex for I think the average retailer So to introduce that to them in a really simplistic way We always say hey le less data points is probably better as long as it really drives behavior uh, in a really simplistic way That's our stance. Oh, I got I have an add-on question to that um, There's a lot of consolidation happening in this space right now um, There's a lot of, of, of money flowing in institutional and otherwise and um, you know just, just to piggyback off your 1% um, top uh, statement, how does that change things, right? So let's look, again, 18, 24 months down the line, and you know what's happening now, I've been telling people, it's kind of like we're building the big three of cannabis right now, using Canada as a, as a test bed. Um, and I think with that, you're gonna start seeing people who own a, a, more, a larger portion of the supply chain, and do you think that's gonna bring a lot of change along with it? <laughs> I, I think it will, but I, I think um, it's not in our best interest to look backwards, but to look forwards. And what I mean by that is that how are people shopping for retail items today? Um, you know, I think the generations coming ahead like the curated, uh, really niche products out there. You see micro brews and alcohol now back on the upswing and, and less and I, Molson Coors, though I think that will be established in the industry, and we're seeing that come to fruition here pretty quickly. But I would hate to see this industry, and I know you mentioned it as, as kind, of, kind of becoming a commodity. I hope it doesn't become a commodity. Those, I don't know if you're out of the Pacific Northwest, but there are really a lot of rich, cool, local brands, and we hope to preserve that, and the way we do that is to really provide them data to connect with the right consumer, and then also enable the retailers to understand what to carry for their local population, but if we kind of just defer and say, hey, there's going to be MedMen and Target and Walmart coming out, then I think we do this industry a disservice, um, in my opinion. But it will, it will change, and hopefully, I think technology will play a huge role in preserving what cannabis has been and, and hopefully will continue to be. Right. You know, I, I think there's definitely a lot to be said about, again, that sophistication moving into the marketplace. I'll never forget the first time I met someone from out of the industry in the senior, I think, it was a year and a half ago, I was speaking up at, in Spok Spokane, Spokane, I never know how to say it, Spokane, um, and the CEO of Dockside Cannabis um, was on a panel with me, and I didn't realize he was like an SVP from Starbucks, right? And so those are the kind of people that are asking the right questions about 
the tools that they're using on a day-to-day -day basis. And at the end of the day, I think there is going to be a, you know, a, a waterfall effect where that impacts the entire industry because these are things that are not happening in a bubble. It's not, these are not advances that are being made for a specific operator. You know, our systems are leveraged by you know, hundreds if not thousands, right? I mean, at this point, we're in a third of the marketplace, so we're seeing data from a lot. And so as more sophisticated uh, operators are coming to play, I see them really pushing the envelope. One more question. So I'm not going to answer your second point, but I will answer your first. <laughs> um, I think you've touched upon something that I'm very passionate about. And, and largely everybody here is a stakeholder in the industry. This is the last, we, we all recognize this is a massive industry for the country. I think this is the, the last industry that is largely built on the shoulders of small businesses. If you look at what's going on in retail with the onset of Amazon, We've been playing under this mutual sum game, uh, or this, sorry, this, this um, zero sum game whereby if you shop on Amazon, you're killing small businesses. And so. You're not. Small businesses are able to survive in, because of, Mark, of, of Amazon. It's uh, a trend that's happened throughout the nation and probably the world where people don't want to go to the brick and mortar stores anymore. Yeah, so look. Correct. Amazon, Correct. And it's facilitating those I think yeah. we're talking about Amazon Marketplace here. Uh, yeah. I'm talking about. I'm talking about the fact that brick and mortar businesses are dying. And so, what I mean by that is, there. If you buy, I don't know what the last thing you bought on Amazon. Call it a bike helmet. I would guarantee you that there's a bike helmet or a similar bike helmet in a 50 mile radius to you, but you chose to shop on Amazon because you knew it was going to be there and you had the purchasing power. Meaning you could compare by price, you could read reviews, you could decide what color you want, it's going to get to your doorstep in two days. M my hypothesis is that the cannabis industry is proving to the rest of the world, by companies like Baker, iHeartJane, etc., that the consumer can be provided the same level of curation and convenience, except every single product you're looking at is not sitting on a warehouse being brought to you and delivered to you by a robot two days later, but is actually sitting on a store shelf somewhere local to you. And I think we're proving that here in the cannabis industry. It's really exciting to see what a wonderful story this would be, whereby not only is cannabis helping to heal the world, but we're actually proving that there's a new way to transform brick and mortar stores into click and mortar powerhouses to compete with the Amazons of the world down the range. Click and mortar, I like that. Yep. And that's happening right now. And California is a very unique, uh, we're in a unique position here. It's one of the few states that has delivery written into the regulations from day one. So you're actually going to be able to do exactly what you just said, where you're, you find a product, um, you don't want to walk into the store, you give your information, you place your order, and it shows up, right? And I guess in, in this, you know, and I'm not, this is not meant to be a disparaging remark at all, but I guess the Amazon comparison would be more of an ease situation, right? Where you don't really know where the product it's coming from at least traditionally and how they were operating before now. Um, but I, I feel like that's changing. People do want to know where it's coming from. And you know, we've done that. I know Socrates does that at iHeartJane where you, you can build a relationship with a store. Um, you can order products from them. If you enable delivery, it can be delivered to you. And then also you will continue to be marketed 
to buy that store because you are a loyalist. Um, and so, you know, we, we do everything we can to provide retailers and brands with tools that allow them to retain their customers. That's our focus is customer retention, right? So you walk into my store or you walk in front of my, my table at a, uh, at a demo day and you give me your phone number, I now know a lot about you and I can send you relevant information that will keep you coming back. So keep looking for more and more about that, uh, more advancements. Um, I think we're just about out of time. Anyone have any last minute questions before we wrap up? All right, well, let's uh, give the panel a round of applause. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for uh, making us feel special up here. Uh, I think we'll probably be around. If anyone has any questions afterwards, feel free to come on up.